is a non-profit organization based in the United States and Kenya that uses online training for students or professionals on the continent. It collaborates with the University of Virginia and provides scholarships to students in more than 39 countries across Africa. Since 2016, it has awarded 6,000 scholarships. Distant Education Africa focuses on business and management courses and certificates to further expand the career opportunities of its students. Another effort from a diaspora organization strives to create satellite campuses of historically black colleges and universities in Africa. It is called HBCU Africa Homecoming Initiative. The chairman of the program explains its goals. The HBCU Africa Homecoming Initiative is actually a one-stop platform endorsed by the African Union to facilitate educational and economic opportunity exchange between HBCUs, African institutions, and the African Union. Morgan State University, a historically black research university in Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States, is leading the way and is set to initiate degree programs in Ghana later this year. In addition to skill building and learning, education can also highlight a path of self-reflection and discovery. Traveling and getting to know another culture can dispel myths about Americans and Africans. Tennessee State University has its own heritage programs. I'm an African American and I realized that because of the generation that I was raised in, I wasn't necessarily told the truth about my history. A lot of things that I found out since starting, unfortunately, the Office of <clears throat> International Affairs, I didn't even know. We were just not given the truth about who we were as a people. And the first time I traveled to the continent and engaged in one of the elders there, it was uh, tear-jerking for me. I just teared up and started crying when the young lady grabbed my hand and said, welcome home, my daughter. It, it literally felt like something was going through my body. The same ground? Birthright Africa was established 10 years ago to connect African Americans with Africa and teach them about their heritage. I came to America as a young child going on 11. I had had some exposure to the continent growing up as a young child, but had had westernized education. And initially, does it really matter? We don't really know that that matters. But as I got older and came of age, I was working in the finance industry and learned about a group called Birthright Israel. And it made me stop in my tracks and say, why is it this happening for people of African descent? Howard University in Washington, D.C. has a large population of Nigerian and Ghanaian students on campus. At HBCUs, we have a very rich concentration um, on black history, black culture across, across um, countries and across cultures. And they want to connect the content of their, their classroom instruction with the actual lived experience of people across the continent. Many American universities provide opportunities for students to take a year abroad, as it is called, to travel and learn in a different country. The underlying belief is that traveling provides a different type of education that opens one's mind to different possibilities while building cross-cultural tolerance and understanding. Zoe Liudaki, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Zoe, for that report. Joining us here in Washington are three distinguished guests. Wala El Sheikh, co-founder and CEO of Birthright Africa. Siddiqui Trawole, president and founder of Distance Education for Africa. And Ernest Obobisa, vice president of the Ghana chapter of the American Field Service. And in New York, we are joined by Karim Williams, a birthright Africa alumnus. Well, I have to say, lady and gentlemen, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the four of you on Straight Talk Africa, the three of you on Straight Talk Africa, for the first time, as a matter of fact. 
Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you for us. Yeah. You're most welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me come to you immediately, uh, Wala. Yes. What exactly is Birthright Africa? Birthright Africa is a nonprofit, but we are a movement. Uh, essentially, we are committed that every youth and young adult of African descent, ages 13 to 30, gets a free trip, free educational trip to Africa as a culminating experience to learn their cultural roots and their legacy of innovation, <clears throat> to understand that resilience and brilliance, both historically, present day, and the future of who we are as a people. And so we provide that sense of pride and confidence in knowing who you are to know where you're going and to know that, the, that it's full of possibilities. So anybody in the age bracket that you mentioned, if they are or claim to be part of the African descent, mm -hmm. they automatically qualify? Yes, as U.S. citizens. So we do uh, have folks register with us as U.S. citizens ages 13 to 30. Any African descent could be African-American, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latinx. And once they register with us, we uh, funnel them to apply with one of our education partners who creates a birthright program for them to be able to explore their culture and history, starting in the U.S. and culminating in the continent. And you are very generous, of course. Uh, you sponsor the trip and room and board while they are on the continent. Yes, so 50% of it right now is sponsored by Birthright Africa and the other 50% by our education partners. So it is absolutely free, food, accommodations, flight, uh, because one of the biggest barriers for traveling uh, mm. for young people is mm. the finances. Uh, the study abroad statistics for students of African descent is quite low. Only 6% right now do a study abroad. And of those that do go to a uh, study abroad, only 4% are going to Africa. So there's a huge gap that we are looking to fulfill because travel is essentially the best education. And what is the reaction so far on both sides of the aisle? I'm talking about... Uh, the American students who go to Africa and uh, their hosts, hosts on the continent. Sure. I know we're going to be talking to Kareem, but uh, from what I have seen, there is a sense of pride and confidence and a connection that is surprising oftentimes. The feeling of a home outside of America that you never knew really existed. And just knowing that there's this greatness in our history that we weren't taught about. And on the African side, they're always excited to see us coming, welcoming us as brothers and sisters, and uh, knowing that we're looking to engage for, f for the future in trade and um, tourism. And some, some of our alumnus even have uh, interest in living and working on the continent. So there's a lot of connection being made and bridging of the gap, which we're really excited to be a part about. Very part interesting. Of. And what about you, Siddiq Traore? Well, thank you very much for having me today. Um, You're most welcome. I am yeah. so excited to be on your show because uh, um, I'm going to talk about distance education for Africa and, uh, you know, to share the incredible success story we've been doing all over the African continent. Um, distance education for Africa is an educational um, organization based in Nairobi, Kenya. Mm -hmm. Our mission, we have three major missions. One, to promote ICT in Africa. Mm -hmm. Two, to contribute significantly to the reducing of poverty. And three, to offer world-class training courses to students and professionals based in Africa, including uh, marginalized areas. Is it true that uh, your headquarters are best... Uh on Koinange Street, downtown Nairobi? Yes, you know, we were in Koinange Street, but, you know, we, we, we left there because, you know, they changed the, the, the office, yeah. So we were based, yeah, the, the headquarters is based in Nairobi. That yeah, means so. we used to be neighbors uh, as an institution because uh, the Voice of America Bureau for East Africa mm -hmm. used to be based on Koinange Street in the Chester House. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> we, we were neighbors, you know. <laughs> yeah, we, we moved, so... Um, Yes, we still are, uh, uh, you know, uh, because we, we are virtual, so it's not really, uh, you know, 
to have an office is not always the best option for people who are virtual. Now, know? when you talk about virtual, uh, talk to me in a language that is accessible to an ordinary English-speaking mm -hmm. member of the audience. Okay. What does virtual exactly mean? Well, virtual means, you know, uh, physically, you know, what we do, we offer courses online. So people receive, you know, courses in Africa, and the course comes from the U.S., from the University of it. That's really what, you know, we do like a virtual learning, you mm. know, online learning. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about today, about uh, what we've done in terms of online. I'm going to talk about the scholarship program, mm. which I want to offer uh, everyone in Africa. Um, the the Af Africa Scholarship Project is a, a collaboration between the University of Virginia, the Darden Business School, mm -hmm. and DE Africa. So we offer courses to people who are based in Africa. Um, the Africa Scholarship Project has two main objectives. The main objective is to associate the learners in Africa mm -hmm. with an innovative educational initiative by bringing top tier university in Africa via modern technologies so and platforms. Those are the main objectives, but we have specific objectives. The specific objectives are one, to offer free online courses to a cohort of African, so they don't pay. Online, online. Co online courses. It's 100% online. How, so, do you, how do you deal with uh, the apparent digital divide? Well, um, the beginning was tough, I must say, but things are moving now in Africa. When we studied um, distance education for Africa, the internet connection was really terrible in some countries. I remember we offer a computer science course from Laval University, and in University of Bangui, for instance, we have 10 students following the course on one computer. Mm -hmm. So it was terrible at that time, but since things have moved, the technology has moved, the platforms have moved. Mm. So um, the way we deal with the technology is we use um, tablets, we use computers, we use cell phone. So cell phone has come handy to solve the digital device. So the specific objective mm. um, to offer online courses, whoever wants to enroll, is open enrollment. They don't pay anything. Two, uh, we want to expand access to education in Africa. You know, access to higher education is very difficult it's, it's in Africa. It's very limited. So, so it's very limited. So what, how is the reaction so far? Well, the reaction so far, we started with only 117 students in seven countries in Africa. Today, I'm proud to say that we have 48 countries. We have over 6,000 scholarships. And the- 6,000. 6,000 scholarships in eight, 48 countries. So but we, we are, are missing- But you are talking about the continent. 6,000 scholarships really is- a... Well, it's a start. Hmm. It's a start. Because the problem, people don't know about our program. So here, we are here today to inform the community that these are available there. So what has been the impact? We started with a business strategy from the University of, Lab, uh, the University of Darden. Mm. When, uh, University we, of Darden? The, the Darden Business School. Where is that? It's it, at the University of Virginia. I see. Yeah, so first of all, I want to thank the University of Virginia for offering all these scholarships to students in Africa. Um, when we started four years ago, we selected only few people in seven countries. Mm -hmm. And the way we selected it, we wanted to create a network of African leaders, of African students who would be trained to become African leaders and create jobs and reduce poverty. That was one of our objectives. So we carefully selected students. We have three types of um, target population. One, we had, we selected poor undergrad, um, underprivileged students. Poor? Well, from universities, because universities are poor, they don't have money. But so, when you say poor, 
and the underprivileged students in Africa, what exactly do you well, mean? Well, I mean students who don't have money, you know, to really start a business. So we are they are in they are in school, mm. but they don't have money to start, or mm. when they finish, they don't have money. So we wanted to select students who are in the privilege, and you know, in Africa, in universities, to if they don't have any business background, they have no business background. So that was the first target population. The second mm. target population was we business people who want to make a, a difference into their community I see. by helping them to unleash their potential business by creating jobs and also uh, help their community to see what their purpose in life is. And the third target was we have CEOs and entrepreneurs in our courses. So the, to answer your question, what was the result? When we offer the uh, courses um, after one year, students told us our courses have provided them with essential business courses that are market relevant, enhancing their problem solving skills, job, ready, job readiness, mm -hmm. and employability. Furthermore, students told us that they have studied applying what they have learned from the business school and they saw immediate response. I see. One good example is we offer design thinking. Design thinking, as you know, is a problem solving course. It's a human centric problem. Mm. When we finish that course, a young man mm. in Malawi called Tembo, Dominic Tembo, used the, a tool called visualization on a struggling company mm. in Malawi to help them to stay afloat. Very interesting. That was one of the best success story we have. So we have so many success stories, you know. Uh, I'll and go we'll, over. Co we'll come to yeah. that later. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, uh, Ernest, you are almost itching also to come on board. Uh, yeah. You have landed. You are on the radar. So, yeah, um, I'm here to talk more about my experience here in America and also um, as being a volunteer for an organization that does more of like intercultural exchange program. Yes. And back home in Ghana, um, I am the volunteer, I'm part of the volunteer that we help uh, students that come from diaspora and also other countries, uh, AFS countries to Ghana. Talk to us about uh, AFS, uh, which uh, happens to be American Field Service. So yeah, AFS, um, AFS Intercultural Exchange, it was an AFS when the First World War started. So um, the AFS was um, standing as like a Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Then they find out that they would like to kind of like make an exchange program so that pe um, other countries will understand um, other, other countries' culture to bring peace. If I understand your culture and you also understand my culture, mm. there's not going to be any war. So that was where AFS started. Um, and that was when the program started. But I'm not in a position to talk much because I am the, I'm a volunteer and I would like to share my experience with them. Were you a beneficiary of uh, AFC? Yeah, AFS, of, um, AFS Intercultural AFS Exchange mm. has um, kind of like helped me to travel the world, to know more about other, other countries' cultures, mm. to understand how people, uh, other countries' cultures are through intercultural learning. And um, it has helped my career as a freelance photographer back home, traveling to other countries, telling stories with my lens in other countries. And also kind of like build me out to kind of like live with other, um, uh, other participants that come on the program to Ghana to, for me to share uh, my culture with them, also learn from them as well. That is very interesting because yeah. uh, the way I understood the American field service uh, type of opportunities when I was in primary school in Uganda mm. in the 1960s mm. is that uh, they would identify students who are in the second year of secondary school, yeah. which you would call 10th grade. Yeah. And uh, they would virtually provide the scholarship, but the family would also make some contribution. So yeah. And so I remember the first member of Kavali, mm -hmm. the neighborhood where I grew up, Kavali town, mm -hmm. the first member I remember 
who benefited from that program was a man called uh, Bir Matama. Mm. He was uh, an incredible goalkeeper at a school called Sinia, okay. which was uh, one of my alma maters. Mm. She gave college to uh, He unfortunately has since died. Uh, may he so rest in eternal peace. And uh, he had a brother called Kaka Matama, mm. who is uh, a Kavari businessman and uh, used to be a mayor for Kavari for many, many years, and someone that uh, I would call a family friend. And uh, the reason I admired uh, Bill was the manner in which, when he came back, was able to speak American English. Yes. He basically reminded me of some of the cinemas, movies that I watched, looking at cowboys like, uh, uh, like uh, John Wayne, mm -hmm. Clint Eastwood, you know, that type of person. And uh, I felt like I wanted to be like uh, Biro Matama, mm. so that I could speak American English. Yeah. There was another guy uh, by the name uh, uh, Jeffrey Sabit Kavushenga, mm -hmm. who was also from the same school. And uh, he has a son who currently happens to be the chief executive officer of New Vision Media Corporation, mm. uh, a parastato, a state parastato corporation in Uganda, which owns televisions, stations, uh, radios, and newspapers, you know, that kind of yeah. stuff. And then there was another young man, was called Kanahe Viryabaho, son of Shungura, who was a neighbor, and also, um, a sub-county chief. Mm -hmm. And I remember those three specific individuals, and I said, God, how could I possibly be like these guys? Mm -hmm. And when I finally came to the United States many, many years later, in a different context and mm -hmm. for different reasons, I remember walking downtown New York in Manhattan. Yeah. I actually found the headquarters of the AFS yeah. near the United Nations. Nation. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, it's true. So um, here in the uh, US, um, the A we have AFS International that operates globally, and we have AFS USA. So um, every country, all the 53 countries that AFS operates mm. um, have um, office there. So in Africa, we have four um, AFS countries, Ghana, Kenya, Egypt, South Africa, and Tunisia. So, um, and I belong to a chapter in Ghana, uh, Accra chapter, and I, be, I am the, mm. the, um, the vice president for my chapter. So what we do in our chapter is kind of like, we would like okay. to find host families for um, students, participants that will come on the program, um, try to be, con uh, find volunteers who will be contact person to them and other things as well. Very so, interesting. Yeah. Let me go to Karim. Good afternoon, Karim. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. I am hugely terrific. Uh, are you terrific? Sorry, say that one more time. I was wondering whether you are equally terrific. I said I was hugely terrific, and I was wearing, wondering whether you are either terrific or awesome, feeling awesome. <laughs> I'm terrific. Well, at, well, I think it's a better word. At least I had to put a smile on your face, Karim. You have to give me credit for that. Now, tell me, where exactly in Africa did you go? I, I went to Ghana. In Ghana, where specifically? Are you talking about Accra? Oh, we were in Accra, and then we also went to Kumasi. You went to Kumasi, to the Ashanti land. How long were you there? Say, we were there for 12 days. For 12 days. And what was your experience like? It's a lot to describe, I'd say, but to, to really sum it up, it was an experience of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Like, I really got in touch with my ancestry for, I'd say, the first time. And when I touched down on the land, it felt like home, because I have a Jamaican background. Yes. And when I touched down on the land and just traveling throughout, it really felt like different parts of Jamaica that I've seen. So it was, uh, 
It, it was a very familiar feeling when I touched down, I'd say. Any particular reason why, for example, you did not go to the Cape Coast, really? You did? Cape Coast? <laughs> Yeah, we went to Cape Coast too. We went to the Almina Castle. Oh, I Almina see. Almina Castle. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Slice dungeon. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, that you, was a powerful experience. I don't know whether you followed the conversation uh, that I had with Ernest earlier. Uh, people who mm. used to be to benefit from uh, this intercultural exchange programs through the American Field Service, they would come back to Africa armed with an American accented English. And some of us would like it so much, would like to go and uh, be part of that experience. And of course, there are others who would wonder why someone is speaking like that. What about in your particular case or your group? Did you pick up some accent from Ghana? So that when you came back to New York, That's funny. you could actually speak with a very beautiful, very beautiful, romantic, proud, African-accented English. <laughs> That's funny. I'd say for maybe the first few weeks after I came back, I still had some sort of accent. But when I was in Ghana, I definitely caught the accent. And But when I came back, that's when I, that's when I really like started to readjust back into American, the American accent, but when I was there, it felt I felt more connected because I, I come from a Jamaican. Like I said, I come from a Jamaican background, and that's my first tongue. So being able to being in Ghana really was similar to that patois tongue. So that gave me a chance to to express myself in that way. Very interesting. What about the music? Oh, the music? So yeah. the music was cool. I already liked Afrobeat in general, uh -huh. but when I, was, when I was there, I noticed there was a large, a large amount of reggae and dancehall music being played, so that felt homely. Did you uh, feel like uh, perhaps you should have had more time to be there? I, would definitely, I definitely wish I had more time to be there. It was a great experience. Like, Especially just the community aspect of it. I felt at home. I felt like I was embraced. I didn't feel I didn't feel a lot of resistance and that's something that I really cherish, just being in a space where I can feel safe to be myself. What are some of the challenges that uh, you think uh, you went through uh, that you would love to share with us? Some of the challenges that I went through when I was there? Yes, please. Okay, so I'd say just general culture shock because in America, in New York in particular, people aren't necessarily as friendly and as open to helping. Mm -hmm. So there were certain situations where I wasn't really sure if somebody was genuinely, genuinely being friendly with me or if they were trying to get something out of me. And I realized that that was just me coming from my own American standpoint and not, that wasn't necessarily their intention out there. So being able to have to identify situations like that and be, be able to distinguish between the two, that was one of the challenges I had to face. What about uh, the stereotypes? I mean, when you grow up uh, like you did in New York, uh, you obviously run, run into uh, a lot of African students, uh, probably uh, from different parts of the continent and uh, you definitely must have had some kind of stereotypes about Africa and the Africans and how they live and all that kind of stuff. What do they eat? <laughs> well, well, growing up in New York, in the high school I went to, which is Benjamin Banneker Academy, I had a really great history teacher. Mm -hmm. name, her name is Miss Samuels, mm -hmm. and she always went back to Africa and always preached the importance of learning about your African heritage and African, African tradition. So going into the trip, I didn't have much stereotypes because I understand that stereotypes are at the end of the day are just generalizations and those generalizations are gonna limit my experience. So I went into the trip with a more open canvas mindset where I just allowed myself to experience what I was experiencing and didn't necessarily limit my beliefs or anything I was seeing. Very interesting. Uh, coming from Jamaica, obviously, 
Uh, you must be aware of one Jamaican African hero, Marcus Garvey. And I'm, yes. sure, I'm sure that uh, you know precisely what Marcus Garvey stood for. Marcus Garvey had wanted yeah. African Americans and uh, the African diaspora to go back to Africa and develop the African continent for the Africans. And he inspired a lot of people, including, for example, the founding president of Ghana, the founding president of Ghana, Pio Sajefo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, pretty much studied really uh, Marcus Garvey's ideology to the extent that uh, together with other things that he learned, was able to help him to help the Gold Coast regain political independence from British colonialism. Did you see some aspects of that on the ground, especially in Accra? Sorry, I didn't hear the last thing you said. I'm talking about uh, the impact of Marcus Gabe, for example, on Ghana through its founding president. Oh, did I see the impact? Uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Did you see some aspects of that in Ghana? The Ghana national team, for example. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's called the Black Stars. Yeah, definitely. What's interesting about that, that you bring that up, I was actually talking to my friend yesterday about that. We had a conversation a few years ago. And in his car, we were talking about uh, the issue of um, the issue of African Americans in America being discriminated and one of the solutions. And I suggested going going back to Marcus Garvey that one of the solutions really would be just to go back to Africa and start building a civilization or not a civilization, building on the society that's out there. So just to see that come full circle and see that actually happening right now is a very 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 powerful thing. And I can see that on the continent because through, especially through the year of return whole campaign, you see a lot of African Americans, African descent, people across the diaspora going back to the continent and really embracing their roots, learning about their past and figuring out how they can implement the knowledge that they gained today into the future. So I saw that through the different, different tour guides that I interacted with, the different stories that I learned about, especially when I was at the slave bath one of the tour, the tour guide that I was interacting with, that my group was interacting with, he was pretty much talking about the importance of coming back and building land on, on African soil so that we can continue to, we can change the tide and be the ones that are more in control of our destiny and more in control of the narrative that, the new narrative that's being created. Very interesting. Unfortunately, time happens not to be our best ally. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away because we'll be right back with you. Being part of Our Voices is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. Every week, connect with our experts. You can ask them your questions and get their advice. Join me, Lina Hamoudou, in Washington on Healthy Living, your new health program right here on Voice of America. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. You can watch our show there and leave a comment. Now let's look at what's on top for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, the United States, Britain and Norway are praising South Sudan for forming a unity government. President Salva Kiir agreed to revert to the original 10 states plus three administrative areas and opposition leader Riek Machar has been sworn in again as the first vice president. 
will the new government manage to end years of conflict that has killed thousands of people and displaced millions? South Sudan in transition on the next Straight Talk Africa. And today we are discussing education for creating bridges between Africa and the United States of America. Our guests are Wala Erisheikh, co-founder and CEO of Birthright Africa, Siddiq Traore, president and founder of Distance Education for Africa, Ernest Obobisa, vice president of the Ghana chapter of the American Field Service, and in New York, we are joined by Karim Williams, a birthright Africa alumnus. I have to say, lady and gentlemen, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the four of you for the first time on Straight Talk Africa. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, you're most welcome. Well, uh, yes. talk to us about uh, what you have learned out of this project so far? What I have learned is that um, that intuition that happens for many of us growing up outside of the continent to want to explore our self-identity and understand where we are, uh, who we are and where we come from is something that all of us share. And so it's been a privilege for me to be part of this movement. And we're really excited about bringing everyone uh, to this work and to have more future uh, global leaders and entrepreneurs like Kareem, mm -hmm. who has expressed to me and many others that they will be connecting continuously into the future uh, to build on what they've learned and to ensure that they are part of the Africa future. And so we are proud that we will be creating the next generation of global leaders and entrepreneurs that are proud of their African heritage, confident in their innovative innovations, and um, truly connected. I mean, Wala, you definitely deserve credit for what you are doing. Thank you. But uh, what really triggered it? Talk to me from the deepest, the better part of the bottom of your Sudanese heart and soul. Because <laughs> a lot of Africans, when they come to America, yes. they first of all deal with what I would characterize as bread and butter issues. Mm -hmm. They deal with what is considered here domestic, in domestic politics to, be, to deal with kitchen table issues. Right. What made you venture into that very important area, really. Well, it's funny enough you say that. I, I, you know, I came here as a young child at the age of 10, and for me, it was that immigrant hustle mentality as a continental African from Sudan. And you were a child of a diplomat. Yes, I was a child of diplomat. So I had a sense of the world and, and access to it. But when you come to America, you find out you are this other thing called black. <laughs> As and an what African. Does that mean? And what does that mean? <laughs> and you're not being taught in school what it means. And so you start learning at the age of, you know, sort of your teens, definitely by your 20s, because you start feeling some of the uh, microaggressions. And so I was going through that challenge and realizing I don't know my history. Mm. I don't know African American history. I don't know African history. And so I needed that journey for myself. And you know, I, I was in the finance industry because I was thinking about just making money yes. and making sure I was comfortable in America. To be perhaps a member someday of Wall Street. I was on Wall Street. <laughs> I was already there. And I Very thought good. that's where I needed to stay. But yes. then this other calling about really understanding the core of who I am and realizing education was truly my passion. I had to make that shift and learned about, you know, the idea to start Birthright Africa and said, this is my calling. And so that was 15 years ago. We've been now operating for five years. And one of the things I also saw at that time is that there's not that many of us in leadership and entrepreneurship positions. African descended people are only 2% of the population of managers, owners, and leaders of African descent. Mm -hmm. I see that on a day-to-day -day basis when we're the only one or two people in a room. I knew others. And part of that creates a sense of doubt. Missing in action in boardrooms yes, around America. Yes, and you have to have a real strong core sense of identity 
and confidence and pride in who you are. So, but if you're not learning that at school, mm. if you may not be learning that at home because your parents are dealing mm. with the, the kitchen issues, mm. then where do you get that? The education system, the nonprofit world can provide a source of connection and that's what we're doing at Birthright Africa. And so we're committed to increasing that number, that percentage of global leaders and entrepreneurs with this exposure to both the history but also the innovative future so that our young people are forever connected to it and become these leaders and entrepreneurs. Very interesting. What mm -hmm. about you, uh, Siddiq? Um, well, the, um, how, did I, how did I start, you know, um, mm -hmm. decent education for Africa? Yeah, uh, I realized that uh, it was you, really were, you were at one time associated with the African virtual universities? Well, at some point I worked for the World Bank mm -hmm. and the World Bank sent me to Africa mm -hmm. and I've traveled across Africa. I traveled in 40 countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. And since I'm an educational, I saw all the issues, all the difficulties. What seemed I, to be the common denominator? Well, first of all, lack of access to resource, training, lack of um, staff development. Mm. So when I go to university, I work with many universities, including Kenyatta University. Right. When I studied D Africa, I studied with teaching English using e-books. I went to 10 countries in Africa, telling them, listen, we want to bring innovation in teaching and learning in Africa. Mm. Let's use e-books to teach English. Mm. From Mali, Senegal to um, um, Guinea, to all the way to Nairobi, Kenya, no university at that time was teaching using e-books, none. Mm. So I told them, you know, e-books is really magical because we have a lecture here in Washington on 16th Street, who she's just sitting in her living room teaching people and she could even make comment on student e-book in Africa. I said, it's magic. Mm. Let's change, you know, uh, things in Africa. I went to one university, they showed me a room full of books, English books, up to, the, you know, old-fashioned books. And I said, let's forget these books. Let's go e-books. We started like that. And then from that, we trained the, some of the lectures on how to incorporate ICT in the classroom. So we really changed life in Africa. And then we continue from English to ICT to cybersecurity. We offer cybersecurity. In a, when I was in Nairobi in 2014, cybersecurity banks were losing two billion Kenya shilling per year for b fraud. <coughs> so we offer that courses. We increase awareness, and then we started this scholarship project, which was now um, our flagship. So what has happened? The result, every year I go to Africa to mm. do a graduation ceremony mm. in various countries. Really um, when people tell me, you know, what these courses have, of, you know, happened to them, the door opened to them. Let me just give you a perfect example. Um, local government and rural development, for instance, in some countries, they need training because they, they have lots of projects. Yeah. So some of the staff have never taken project management and planning in their life. Any so, particular reason why governments, for example, because do they not don't provide that? Limited, limited fund. They limited don't have, funds? They don't have. They don't when have. you have uh, the government elite driving some of the most expensive, for example, vehicles. Exactly. You, you, you really need, but they, have, they buy houses in Europe, yes. in North America. I, I agree with you. They send their children. Yes. I, very expensive European American schools, yeah, but, not at home. Yes, and no. you talk about funds. This is what they talk about fund. Some is it of a them, question, perhaps, of priorities? Well, it could be in specific countries. So that's only one example, you know. So they work with um, rural areas, they, you know, to develop projects, and they need. They don't have formal training. They, some of them have never had any formal training. Mm. But taking our courses help them mm. to manage properly mm. the project. Um, you take Minister of Education, for instance. In Minister of Education, you have some people who are coordinating um, staff development, 
and performance managers. Mm -hmm. But what kind of issues are there? You see in the Ministry of Education, low morale, uh, you have limited resources, and you have you know, uh, management. It's not the best style. Limited so, resources, but you have, again, you have the elite, for example, even going for medical checkups. Yes, I agree in with Europe, you. In mm Europe, -hmm. in North America, yes. without caring about providing that same infrastructure yes. yeah. for but, the less fortunate people. Yes, no, I agree. I agree with you. You know, that's, that's the case. But our courses are open to everyone. Mm -hmm. We have unemployed, we have priests, we have from CEO, we have professor, university professors taking open up. open for everyone. But it's again, open for everyone. But I said that uh, you will run probably into some kind of digital divide. Yes. Because, let's face it, look, look at the infrastructure. Yes. In order for somebody to be part of your experience, mm -hmm. they need to be in a neighborhood, for example, which provides electricity. That's true. Correct? Yes. Yeah. But so so can you imagine what a percentage of those people that you are supposed to be helping mm -hmm. do not really have access? Yes, but that's, that's really where we reach. I could tell you we have some courses in some rural areas. You will be you know, s surprised. There is a, a city in Kano. It's 500 kilometers from Bangi. Mm. There was a young man there. He has a d satellite dish. He's never taking online courses. Mm. Most of our students have never taken online courses. Mm. So we were able to reach those areas mm. with our courses. So um, the, you know, the, there, are, there are challenges, of course, mm. I agree. But if I tell you the impact of what we've done, um, I could give you a pro project management, for instance. There have been this young guy in Kenya. His name is... Uh, um, John Kialo, mm -hmm. he has no idea about how to manage projects. So mm. he took our courses, project management, and now became a project manager of a construction company. And now he's caring. He could take care of himself now. That's only one. But we have individuals taking our courses, but ministries and, you know, taking also our courses, as well as the minister of uh, um, local government, I was mm. just mentioned, minister of education taking our courses. Um, we have in some countries all ministries taking our courses. So um, it's been, we are bringing education to people who, you know, otherwise will not have access to those uh, courses. What, so, what would you say is the single most important decision that you have made so far? The most decision I have made so far is, uh, Shaka, not to give up to persevere, to continue, to push, to think about people in Africa who need education. Mm. And when I was in Dakar, the, I do the graduation ceremony every year. I go to different countries. Mm. Last year in Dakar, they gave me this big painting of the baobab tree in mm. Africa. Yes, they called me, Siddiqui, you have a baobab of Africa in education. Mm. I was named the top, one of the top 100 most influential people yes, on online in Africa. Tell us what, about that. Well, what we have, they have selected people who have made a difference in online, in workplace places. And who, the, is, who is behind that selection? The e-learning e Africa is a big company, this organization, you know, selected, is sent selection. Best to, where? Yes. To have, where they, is it based? They are based in Germany, but they are in Africa every year. Okay. E-learning Africa okay. conducted that, and okay. then I was selected among the 100 most Yes. So it was just a big honor for me to be able to uh, have made the difference in the education in Correct. people's life. What would you say is the single most courageous decision that you have also made? Well, the single most courageous decision is not to fear. Um, when I started promoting Dingi, Dingi Africa, I left uh, Senegal mm -hmm. to go to Guinea Bissau. Mm -hmm. From Guinea Bissau, I crossed the border to come to Guinea. When I reached a town one day, I, I had meeting plan because of 
you know, I wanted to travel in all these countries. Mm. I reached to a city, a small town in Guinea-Bissau, at the border. I miss the transport, the bus, the bus. I have to wait for the next, the next day. But they told me, well, you could take a motorbike to cross the border. Mm. Because those people, you know, they, 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 you know, borders are porous, you know, so you could. And they told me it's difficult mm. because there are rivers. Yes. And I said, okay, I'm ready to go because I came to help Africa. So I just said, okay, let's go. And they put my, my uh, um, suitcase on this motorcycle. Mm. We reach a, a river. The river has crocodiles. And I said to myself, should I get on this you know, uh, canoe to mm. cross? Mm. What about if the canoe flip? <laughs> but Shaka, with my determination to help Africa with education, yes. nothing could have stopped me to go. Congratulations. I went and I crossed. So, um, you know, I think that was one of the most courageous, you know, things. And on that journey, when mm. I reached Guinea, mm. another, from Guinea to Dakar, I took another car. And I faced the first challenge, another challenge there because crossing another bridge, mm. and I have to help them to turn. There was just a small board, and then there is a, a chain you have to turn so that it moves, the bridge moves. So those two experiences yeah. were the most challenging thing in bringing education to Africa. Definitely required college. Yeah. What about finally, what you would consider to be the single most regrettable decision so far? With uh, distance education for Africa? Yeah. Um, I don't really think I have that much regret, you know, because for me, every single day, when people tell me, Sidiki, you have opened my life, you have given me job skills, mm -hmm. um, yes, it, it, it keeps me going. It keeps me going. So, I, you know, I... I have given my life to this education, to this organization, and I think God has helped me to mm. push it and to get this scholarship which are, we are giving to people in Africa. Your so, decisions have really, in some way, shape, or form, helped to put some smile on some people's faces. Yes, I, I agree. You Is know. that a very difficult thing to do, especially when we talk about the African leadership? Uh, where you find that uh, some of them end up, in fact, putting miseries on the faces of millions of our people, their decisions, decisions that they make. And yet you have an Africa that is probably the wealthiest in terms of resources on this planet Earth, and yet the Africans are the poorest. They can't even guarantee three meals a day for their families. Yes, yes. No, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's really, uh, it's a question of allocating resources to people because access to education is very difficult because, as you know, if you look at access to higher education, how many people, what's the percentage? It's very low. Africa has the lowest in terms of accessing to adequacy. And so, even uh, then, when you talk about that type of education, you are not even talking about whether, in fact, it is quality education. I, I, I agree, you know. So what people are telling me, it's like, Siddiqui, you bringing quality education to Africa and it's opening door because our courses are market-oriented. Mm. Mm. That's really one of the best things with the Darden Business School. And this university has given us this over 6,000. Our, our dream is to reach the entire African continent. So far, we are in 48 countries. We are missing only six countries. Mm. And by the end of the year, we're going to cover the entire. We'll have, have students in the entire 54 countries in Africa. We have volunteers who are social media um, contacts, WhatsApp people. So I want to thank all of them for making a, an impact in their community and informing people and mm. telling people, this is what we've done. Distance Education of Africa has given me training opportunity. They have been sharing it. 
So that's why also every year I go to Africa and we celebrate. Very, very. We, we take pictures, we take videos, and we share the entire continent. Thank you for your service so far. Ernest, what about you? What have you learned so far? And in fact, you belong to another generation. What I, what I learned so far uh, with my AFS background that showed me um, how um, giving other people opportunities to do whatever they want to do really in terms of skills. Talking in this way, um, as back home in Ghana, that when someone have the skills to kind of like develop in a society, um, you don't get a chance to kind of like do because you are not good in theory. Mm. But when you're good in practicals, mm. it's very, very difficult for um, someone or an institution to employ you or to give you a chance to prove to them that you also can do it. But when I came to America, I kind of like learned that they gave everyone opportunity to kind of like do. Um, in terms of like in Ghana, they don't give much attention to, in Africa, they don't give much attention to technical uh, school um, who are very kind of like good in skills. So I learned in America that they like they give everyone opportunity to kind of like express himself, um, do whatever you can do to kind of like help um, um, like the organization or whatever you find yourself. Uh, so I've learned a lot that no matter what you are and the skills that you have, I you see. can also do it. Unfortunately, my friend Anik, uh, Ernest, time, as they say, is not our best ally. Yes. And in the studio 47, there is no democracy sometimes. The producer says, go. You have to go. Yes. On that note, our guests today were Wala Elishek, Siddiq Trawale, Ernest Obobisa, and in New York, Karim Williams joined us. Thanks to our audience for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better, Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive. <laughs>